Thanks, Richard. Uh, my wife and kids call me the Lorax with a calculator. <clears throat> Today I'm going to talk about three currents that form the river of American identity. A river that cuts through time and spawns the character of who we are. From the beginning, we've all want to attach ourselves to the need to protect our natural world. Nowhere has this been clearer than the river that has woven America. And I don't have my slide clicker, so bear with me. From, from, George Washington set the first current in motion in 1785 when he organized a series of meetings around the wise use of our natural resources. From Mount Vernon to Annapolis to Philadelphia itself, a force was gathering, and at the center of it was water. Washington knew that for a nation to prosper, it must secure itself by forming a union. So the need, thanks Richard. <laughs> so the need for a resource framework ultimately helped stitch the states into an economic and political union. And out of that union, an economic highway and a national identity and character was built. Later, President Theodore Roosevelt would, would take conservation and try to seek it as a right as important as free speech by linking the stewardship of our natural resources to civilization as a moral imperative. And so a second current was born, conservation as a national duty. Roosevelt would use his powers to save over 200 million acres of land, and in the final weeks of his presidency, sought to take conservation to the world by requesting that the developed nations meet in The Hague to take inventory of the world's resources as a basis of creating permanent and lasting peace. But as Roosevelt's clock ran out and politics ensued, the 35 nations set to meet would find the meeting forestalled by the incoming president. And so the river went underground for a while. But now a third current emerges. It picks up where Roosevelt left off. Today we seek to re replenish the earth by attaching price and value to nature's assets. We need to move beyond the obstacle of treating our natural resources as though it was a business in liquidation. No longer can we afford to value a tree only when it is cut down. You see, the beauty of the ecosystem marketplace is that it creates a countervailing price and value for a tree as a tree. Let's talk about price for a moment. Price creates choice. Through price, we do many things. We buy one good over another. For most of us, price rules some things in and other things out. Price creates a system of priority and reveals how and where we place our choices. Every choice expresses value. Price is also a mediator of cooperation. Through price, we trade and negotiate our needs. As price mirrors perceived value, people with different values can come together through a mechanism that engenders trust and spares conflict. So price is a way of broadly engineering social collaboration, and it does so rather efficiently. Price also forces change. As resources become too precious, we do without. Not only does price affect the flow of resources, it arbitrates the way they're used, combined, spent, or saved. Ultimately, price expresses humanity's opinion of itself. The price principle has moved us forward as a civilization, but it has not included nature within its orbit. So when the default price, by virtue of not putting a price on our environment, is zero, then what does that say about us? It means the spirit of capitalism is just not large enough. So if, if a currency for conservation could use the tools of price and profit to accomplish more than today's commercial climate is prepared to do, then capitalism could have the best of the old and the best of the new. Our company chose this new path. First we thought big, then small. And what we arrived at 
was ACRE, Advanced Carbon Restored Ecosystem, a new currency for conservation. ACRE houses all the environmental attributes associated with the restoration or conservation of one physical acre of property. Acre's more than carbon. It's biodiversity credits, water credits, water storage credits, nutrient credits, and so forth. Ultimately, Acre is about multiplying the forest assets in order to build equity back into our planet. With Acre as our organizing mechanism, we launched our Green Trees program in the Mississippi Alluvial Valley. Why? We want scale and impact, pure and simple. You see, the Mississippi Alluvial Valley is America's arc of biodiversity. It's a flyway for 60% of all birds on the North American continent. And it drains 41% of the United States and two Canadian provinces. But because the marketplace has a shorter window of time than that of Mother Nature, we needed to accelerate how we we're going to deliver this impact. So we went to work. With nature as our mentor, we came up with a reforestation design that mimics nature by compressing time and space to yield a forest faster. And what we arrived at was a cottonwood hardwood interplanting. We are interplanting fast growing native cottonwoods with slower growing mixed hardwoods on each acre. Cottonwoods act like a nurse tree. They grow eight to 15 feet a year. They control the weeds, they provide dappled sunlight to the hardwoods, and they enable forest permanence. Next, we needed to create a pathway to scale. Because price rules things in or out, we chose not to buy land, but to bring the landowner into a partnership model. But in order to do this, we needed to change some thinking. We had to move away from this notion that we were going to maximize one income stream to one that's going to optimize multiple ones. Again, nature does this, and we honor her best when we mimic her. You see, nature's not a one-trick pony, and neither is the acre mechanism. So I'm proud to say, with hundreds of landowners as partners and two main investors in Duke Energy and Norfolk Southern Railways, we have already planted millions of trees and we have over two million tons of carbon under contract. But we're just beginning. Our aim is to one day reforest and restore one million acres of land in the Mississippi Alluvial Valley and to take our program across the world. It has been through the simple concept of price that we have learned how to value nature and organize ourselves to replenish the earth. But in the end, but in the end, it all begins with landowners, the ones who plant trees under whose shade they may never sit, the ones that plant hope, purify the air, clean the water, and create life. For inside the seed of one acorn is a thousand forest, a place where faith and reason is renewed, a place that quenches the thirst of the soul, and one that nourishes the minds of your children, and hopefully one day theirs. As these three currents merge into the river of America, the dawn of a more purposeful union is underway. From the first stirrings of a nation to a country navigating the choppy waters of accelerated growth, to the regulatory state of today, we are ushering in the age of natural capitalism, where conservation has a purpose and capitalism a heart. At that intersection is the notion of building equity. My parents instilled in me a simple truth. There are two great joys in life, the tilling of the land and the cultivation of character. One anchors us and the other elevates us. For centuries, we've understood the tilling of the land, but we've only faintly grasped how the cultivation of character deepens the soil of the mind and spirit. Within each of us is character. Under all is the land. 
And like a river that drops out of sight for a while, only to reemerge greater and stronger, so it will be with America and the world. My message to you today is this. Go forth, build equity, cultivate character, and replenish the earth. Thank you. Thank you.